All righty then. Okay, folks, we're on. Bama just scored. What's Bama? I have no idea what Bama is. Okay, you guys ready? How's my sound? Sound coming in clear? How's my sound? Is it coming in clear? In Jesus' name. Yeah. Uh, to, to answer your question, I don't know if I get paid by the ads. I have no idea how YouTube works. I don't know how <clears throat> ads contribute to me getting paid. I have no idea, to be honest with you. And another thing I don't have an idea, I have no idea how to produce videos and clips like David Wood does. So what I really need, right? I got to get my muscle mass back. I will. Don't hate. Right. I really need either a brother in the Lord Jesus Christ who's willing to take the time to help me do videos as a token of love for the ministry, for the glory of Jesus, and or maybe even a godly wife who loves Jesus and would come alongside and work with me. How about that one? Yeah, I don't know. I, I'm I'm technologically Ill illiterate. You know, I really am. I really haven't taken the time and made the effort to study how to get the most out of YouTube. That's where David Wood's genius comes in, right? That's where David Wood's genius comes in. Let me tell you what kind of genius this guy is. Over 10 years ago, he told me, look what he told me. I'm going to get it. I'm going to get my traps back. Don't worry. I promise by the grace of Jesus, I'm going to get them back. Right? In Jesus' name. Anyway. But uh, 10 years ago, David Wood told me to start doing YouTube videos. And another genius is Jay Smith. Those two geniuses saw the advantage of YouTube over 10 years ago. Right? Yeah. It's getting there. Over 10 years ago. But one thing about me, I hate to see myself on camera, and I hate to hear my voice. I prefer to write. David Wood is the opposite. He hates to write. But now I've learned we live in an age, whether we like it or not, people would rather watch something than read something, and they'd rather watch something that's 10 minutes than watch something that's an hour. That's the age we live in. May the Lord Jesus save us from that because we need to be disciplined enough to read more, especially the Holy Bible, and to be able to watch sessions, sermons, instructions, even if they're two hours long, right? Because that's where you'll find these treasures, these treasures, right? These troves that unpack the depth, the beauty, the majesty, and bring out the meat of the Holy Bible, God's Word. Before I begin... Exactly. Well, Abdul Halaj... You need to go to my websites and read the articles. I have about 200 articles, maybe more, detailed refutation, exposition on the core doctrines of the Christian faith, as well as exposing Islam. Before I begin, I want to repeat this again one more time because I don't want to repeat it every session. I keep getting comments of people saying that I need to ignore the people who are distracting me in the comment section for those who are offline, who watch offline. Now, I do agree when we have trolls, agents of Satan, dogs coming to attack, I need to ignore them. And by the grace of Jesus, by the power of the Holy Spirit, I will. So the admins are going to be on the ball to block them. However, I can't ignore the comments when it comes from sincere, sincere students of the word whom I'm interacting with because that's the purpose of the comment section. The purpose of the comment section is for me to engage, interact with the people, so I can make sure by the grace of God's Spirit, they're understanding the point. I'm not confusing them because I want you to understand these truths so that you can be strengthened in the truths of the faith. As you can see, I have a lisp. And then be emboldened by the Spirit to proclaim them for the glory of Christ. So please bear with me. And speaking of the devil, and pray for the internet connectivity in Jesus' name. Stay strong, please, Lord, for your glory. Speaking of the devil, let's see. We got a devil here. Right here. Okay, hold on. In my 
All right. Sorry about that. We have a little devil here. Okay. Sorry about that. So now, are we ready to continue with part two? And again, welcome. And another thing, another word, a little Unitarian heretic devil parroting the same pathetic objections that we've refuted, you know, over and over again. Ad nauseum, ad infinitum. And another thing I want to say again, I haven't said this enough. I truly mean this. And I thank the Lord Jesus Christ and I praise the Lord Jesus Christ for the grace and the favor and the love he's put in the hearts of my brothers and sisters for supporting me through their prayers and their finances. So I want to thank you, my brothers and sisters who are partnering with me via Patreon or even PayPal to help me to, to continue to do this work by the grace of the Lord Jesus Christ for the glory of the Lord Jesus Christ. You know who you are. Forgive me if I have not reached out to you personally and thank you. Please don't take that personally. I have a lot on my plate, and until I'm finally completely delivered from these trials and I'm settled in, I'm going to be running around because of some external factors beyond my control. But Jesus Christ, my Lord, is preserving me by his love, by his power, and he will see me through it for his glory till the end. My trust is in him. So I want to thank you. You know who you are. Thank you from my heart. The Lord Jesus bless you. And preserve you and fill you. And I pray Jesus will continue to fill me to bless you. Thank you so much. You know who you are. I love you. And I don't love you because of the money. I love you because you love Jesus. And you're trusting that Jesus Christ is working through me to bless you. And that blesses me. I love you for the sake of Jesus, which is why I'm doing this. And I love you because you love the Lord Jesus Christ. You're not here because I'm pretty or a muscular, even though I am pretty muscular, you're here because you're trusting that Jesus Christ is using me and anointing me to speak to you, glorify his name, and unpack the word. So thank you. You know who you are. Please, God bless you and preserve you. And again, I couldn't do this without God stirring your hearts to partner with us financially because we are in full-time ministry, right? So thank you, every one of you. I love you guys. And I, even though I love you imperfectly, and even though... I can be short-fused and impatient. Forgive me for my imperfections and shortcomings. I really pray God will deliver me from that to be more like Jesus so I can be more loving and so I can shine more brightly for his glory. But until then, I'm a work in progress, and the Lord allows us to struggle with our imperfections and sins to keep us humble and at his feet, right? And I'm not trying to use that as a license or justify my imperfections and my sins. But God is good. He is perfect, and we depend on him, and we love you. Father, we love you. Lord Jesus, we love you. Holy Spirit, we love you. Father, please wash us in the blood of Jesus. Cleanse us and purify us in the blood of Jesus Christ, your beloved Son, your heart who became flesh, and forgive us and forgive me for failing. Crucify our flesh in the power of your Holy Spirit. Seal us by your Spirit. Fill us with fruit and life and power from your Holy Spirit, and transform us by your Spirit to become more like the Lord Jesus Christ. And Father, please bless this session, bless this YouTube channel, bless these videos and bless the articles and use them for the glory of your son, the Lord Jesus, your son whom you love. You are glorified when your son is glorified. The Holy Spirit is glorified when your son is glorified. So Father, bless this session. Anoint my mouth to speak truth without error for the glory of Jesus and cleanse my motives, Lord, and save me from my flesh and from being unnecessarily offensive. And anoint me to speak truth without error, without stammering, without confusion. And bless your people, Father. Illuminate them. Enlighten them by your spirit to see the depth of your word, the beauty of your word, the majesty of your word, to fall more passionately in love with the Lord Jesus and to live for him more perfectly and to be willing to die for him if necessary. Destroy our fears, our doubts, our unbelief. And Father, we say a special prayer for Andrew Martin. Here's a man who claims to be an atheist, but in his heart... He loves Jesus. We know it. We can see it. He's in love with Jesus, and he can't live without Jesus. Bring him to the feet of Jesus. Bless him, Father. He's even declaring war against Islam. Please, Lord, you will never leave nor forsake him as well. Convict him, Lord. Something may have happened in his life that may have broken his heart, but, Father, show him how real you are, and that no matter how much he runs away, he can never run too far away from your love because Jesus has him. 
and Jesus has his heart. Thank you for this man. He encourages me, Lord. And Father, please watch over our loved ones. Watch over my daughters, Lord. Cover them with the blood of Jesus. Fill them with your love and save them and preserve them and, and preserve me for them, Lord. And provide through me for them, Lord. And fight these wicked battles that try to destroy my family and keep us together. Because we need you. Please, Abba. Because of Jesus, we can call you Abba. Avinu. Baba. Babi. Babit Kunan. We love you. We love you, Lord Jesus. And we love you, Holy Spirit. Have your way in Jesus' name. Yehovah, Father, Son, and Spirit. Yehovah, Father, Son, and Spirit. Yehovah, Father, Son, and Spirit. Yes, yes, in Jesus' name. And Father, I echo that. Surround us with a wall of fire from your Holy Spirit. A wall of fire from your Holy Spirit. A wall of fire from your Holy Spirit in Jesus' name. Amen. I echo that in Jesus' name. Man, tell me about it. I want to read this. Amen. Look at this. Tony, God bless you, my brother. Being a teacher is a heavy duty. Man, tell me about it. I worked as a teacher for nine years, sometimes being a torture. I know very well, brother. No human being can judge your temper. Just Jesus. Thank you, man. I love this guy. Man, can you come and live next to me? Because I need people like you to just encourage me and just give me a hug. I need a hug. I'm alone. And uh, all kidding aside, yes, I did. God willing, Wednesday I'm on my way. All kidding aside, for the last two years, I'll be honest with you guys, I've been alone without my kids. As long as my kids were with me, I was never lonely. I was just filled with joy and content to see their smile, to have their hug. It just, it was amazing. Right now, I haven't seen them in four months, and I'll be honest with you, I am lonely. As one book I read, the cover, it said, sometimes lonely, but never alone. Sometimes lonely, but never alone. And I want to get in a pity party, but it would sure be nice if I can have them in my arms again and if God is willing, a godly woman who loves Jesus this time, sold out for Jesus. If not, may he give me the grace of contentment because he's worthy. All right? Okay, are we ready now to go into part two? Yep. Two years and counting. Are we ready to go into part two to unpack the meat? Okay. For those of you who did not listen to yesterday's session, a lot of what I'm going to say is not going to make sense. But I can't repeat the things I discussed Yesterday, I'm going to have to build on that foundation by the grace of God's spirit, right? Amen, Rebel Mark. I receive it in Jesus' name. Okay. So are we ready? Because I'm going to continue from yesterday. I can't go back. Sumir, what's up, my brother? Is it Summit? I don't want to give away too much. If it's you, I'm going to see you tomorrow at, in church, if that's you. But anyway, I can't continue. I mean, repeat what I laid yesterday. So you got to listen to yesterday or it's not going to make sense. I'm showing you that the entire Hebrew scriptures were deliberately designed by the Holy Spirit to be a portrait, a picture of Jesus Christ, our Lord. And I'm not just talking about statements, talking about the future deliverer, right? That will come from the line of David and born in this place. I'm talking about even historical events and even individuals in their lives were modeled by God's sovereignty. Now, don't get me wrong. These are true historical events. They're not myths, true historical events, but were shaped and designed in such a way by God's providence to point to the Lord Jesus Christ and his life. You with me there? So what I'm answering is the objection. Why would Matthew and Matthew 2 verse 15, specifically 14 and 15, misquote Hosea chapter 11 verse 1? Because in Hosea chapter 11 verse 1, it says when Israel was young, God loved Israel, and out of Egypt, he called his son. When Israel was young, I loved him, and out of Egypt, I called my son. It's not about Israel being saved by God out of Egypt, brought into the wilderness, preserved there, and then brought into the promised land. But Matthew quotes it in reference to Joseph taking the Lord Jesus Christ into Egypt to save the Lord Jesus from the threat of Herod. How could he dare misquote? That passage that way. After I'm done with this session, you're going to truly see Matthew was inspired by the Spirit, filled with such wisdom that truly must have come from the Lord Jesus Christ. He knew the Old Testament better than his detractors, and he saw things by the grace of God's Spirit that will blow your mind. He didn't misquote. He didn't misapply. So are you ready now to go into the meat? Okay. 
Folks, admins, when you see distractions and shindle of the devil, get rid of them real quick so we don't waste time. Okay. What Matthew saw is what the Old Testament already told us, that Jesus Christ is true Israel. Jesus Christ is true Israel. So that he's going to relive the moments, the experiences of the nation of Israel with one difference. Where they failed, he will succeed. The nation of Israel becomes a picture of Jesus, who's true Israel. That's why I even titled it Jesus Christ, the true Israel. Because I'm going to show you in Scripture, Jesus is given many names, names which identify him with the nation and specific individuals in that nation. Are you aware that one of Jesus' prophetic names is Israel? Are you aware that another of Jesus' names is David? He's called David and he's called Israel. Did you know that? Are you aware of this? Prophetically, he's called Israel and he's called David. Now, many of you should know this because you probably already studied it. Or if you've been with me over the years, I've already covered this material previously in previous sessions over the years, both on Pal Talk and on YouTube. Right? Okay. But let me prove that to you. Let's go to Jeremiah chapter 30, verse 9. One of the names of Jesus is David. And one of the names of Jesus is Israel. So let's unpack it. Remember the different types of prophecies and hermeneutical principles. Not Mashiach ben David, son of David. He's called David. Here, Jeremiah 30, verse 9. But we're going to read 8, 9. And thank our brother Protestant for serving us by posting verses to make it easier for me. We're going to read verses 8 and 9. Okay, watch here. When Jeremiah wrote this, he's writing around the 6th century B.C. Approximately, David died around 1000 A.D., so this is 6th century B.C. So this is about 500 years after the death of David. 500 years after the death of David. Now let's read. For it shall come to pass in that day, saith Jehovah, Yehovah of hosts, that I will break his yoke from off thy neck. Meaning the, the nations who have oppressed you and enslaved you, I'll break their yoke off your neck, my people, and will burst th thy bonds, and strangers shall no more serve themselves of him. But they shall serve Yahovah, Jehovah their God, and David their king, whom I will raise up unto him. Did you catch it? God says the day will come where they will serve you, my people. In fact, the whole world will serve me, Jehovah, and David their king. David was dead at this time. So is God saying he's going to physically resurrect David to rule again? David will be physically resurrected, but will he be physically resurrected to rule again? Or is God speaking of a Davidic type, someone who's like David, because David is a type of someone else, someone who, in fact, who's greater? How do we know? How do we know? Is it talking about David himself being resurrected to rule? Because he will be resurrected. All the dead in Christ will be raised physically. Or is he talking about someone who's like David, whom David prefigures, foreshadows? Okay. Let's look at the language again so we, we'll get the answer from Jeremiah. Jeremiah will give you the answer. Don't run to the Psalms, Nate. Try to prove your case, if you can, from the book itself. Let's look at Jeremiah 30, verse 9, one more time. Okay. 30, verse 9. You don't need verse 8, Protestant. I know you're trying hard to uh, appease me, but no matter how much you try to appease me, I'll never be satisfied because I'm human and you can never do enough to make me happy, even though I love you. Not, okay, Jeremiah 30, verse 9. Let's read. But they shall serve Jehovah their God and David their king. Now pay attention to language. Whom I will raise up unto them. I will raise up unto them. Okay, but now let's go to Jeremiah 23, verses 5 and 6. Jeremiah 23, verses 5 and 6. Here it says, David, I will raise up for them. But then look at Jeremiah 23, 5 to 6. Behold, the days come, saith the Lord Jehovah, that I will raise unto David a righteous branch. Okay, and I'm confused, God. You first said you're going to raise up David for them, but now you're saying you're going to raise up a branch, Simach, Hebrew Simach, meaning a son from the tree of David, from the root of David. You're going to raise up for David. Right, A righteous branch and a king shall reign and prosper and shall execute judgment and justice in the earth. In his days 
shall Judah be saved, Judah shall be saved, and Israel shall dwell safely, and this is his name whereby he shall be called Yahovah, our righteousness. So notice, a branch, a human descendant, an offspring of David from the family tree of David will be raised up. He will be the king who will save Judah. And notice his name. He'll also be called Jehovah our righteousness. Wow. Wow. Did you catch it? So it's not David that God raises up to rule, but a human descendant of David, a branch from the family tree of David, will be raised to rule, who will be Jehovah, our righteousness. Now let's go to Jeremiah 33, 15 and 16. Jeremiah 33, verses 15 and 16. Wait, it's going to get better. In those days and at that time will I cause the branch of righteousness to grow up unto David. Notice again, he repeats the promise. I will cause the branch of righteousness, right, to grow up unto David, and he shall execute judgment righteous in the land. And those days shall Judah be saved, and Jerusalem shall dwell safely. And this is the name wherewith she shall be called Jehovah our righteousness. Now Jerusalem will be called Jehovah our righteousness. Do you know why? Because oftentimes the city is named after her king, its king. Jerusalem will be called Jehovah Righteousness because that's the city where Jehovah, her king, dwells in. But who is the Jehovah who's dwelling in Jerusalem? The branch of David. You catch it? And so, are you with me there? France, answer your own question. Why would God emphasize Saul when Saul rejected God, was accursed of God, condemned by God because of unbelief? France, answer your own question. Right? It's like saying, why doesn't God mention Asa, the brother of Jacob, or Ishmael? Okay. But coming back to the issue. Here's my question for every one of you. Here's my question. Since chapter 23 and chapter 33, one comes before chapter 30, one comes after chapter 30, has already told us that the king that God raises up for the nations, for the people to serve, is not David, but a human descendant of David. Are you trying to now tell me that in Jeremiah 30 verse 9, when God says through Jeremiah that he will raise up David their king, he means the actual historical David? Or should we see this for what it is, that this human descendant of David is called David because he's like David, and David foreshadows him? You get it? So... Do you see how I just proved exegetically, contextually, that Jeremiah 30, verse 9, it's not talking about David, the historical king, being resurrected to rule, but it's talking about a Davidic type, a Davidite, someone who's like David, whom David foreshadows, prefigures. Right? Is that clear? Did I make my case exegetically? Did I prove it, prove it from Jeremiah? Now, don't take my word for it. Thank God for modern technology and Google. Google the word branch. Put rabbinic Judaism, and I have the citations in my articles. Lord willing, I'll, I'll post links in the description box. In the Talmud and other rabbinic sources, the title branch, Simach, was taken to be a title of Messiah. Even the rabbis admitted. Even the rabbis admitted. That branch Simach is a title of Messiah. Simach. You with me there? So even the rabbis took these to be prophecies of the Messiah to come. Because the branch of David has to be the anointed ruler who will come and fulfill all of God's promises to David. Simach. You with me there? 
It's not just Christian. Even the rabbinic Jews understood it that way. Lopez is, is, is all over the place. He's going to Proverbs 30, verse 4. We're not there, buddy. We're sticking on Jeremiah. Now, did you see, did you see that one of the names of this branch, this son of David, the anointed one, the Messiah, is David? That's one of his names? He's called David. Does everyone get that before I move on to the next point? Now, where is he called Israel? Where is he called Israel? Okay, let's go to Isaiah 49, verses 1 to 3. Isaiah 49, verses 1 to 3. Okay. Isaiah 49, verses 1 to 3. Read with me. Listen, O isles, and unto me, and hearken, ye people. From far, Jehovah hath called me from the womb. Pay attention. This is where you have to be an attentive reader by the grace of God's spirit. Okay? Yeah. O isle, unto me, and hearken, ye people, from far. Jehovah hath called me from the womb, from the bowels of my mother, hath he made mention of my name. Pay attention. And he hath made my mouth like a sharp sword, and the shadow of his hand hath he hid me, and made me a polished shaft. In his quiver hath he hid me. In other words, this means I am Jehovah's agent of destruction. I am Jehovah's warrior to destroy his enemies. I am his arrow, his sword, which he wields to destroy the unbelievers and the wicked. That's what verse 2 is saying. But now notice verse 3. And said unto me, Thou art my servant, O Israel, in whom I will be glorified. See, right there, and this is what happened in the debate with James White. And again, you may say, well, I'm bashing this guy and hate this guy. May God purify my heart not to hate him, but to hold him to the same standard that he uses against Christians where he ungraciously attacks them in his DL shows. This is what Lee Barker, I believe his name is, in the debate with, David, with James White did. He kept saying, the servant of Isaiah is Israel, the nation. It's not the Messiah, and it's not Jesus. And James White couldn't answer. His answer was, well, there's an immediate fulfillment and a greater fulfillment. Let me just say this again. Lee Baker, right? I said Barker. I don't even know his name. It should be Lee Barker because he barked a lot. But anyway, may God have mercy on him and restore him to repentance. Okay. Let me say this again. Not everyone is gifted to do everything. God has deliberately designed it where the different members of the spiritual body of Christ will be given different gifts and no one individual will be given all the gifts. I'll be given some, you'll be given some, and you'll be given gifts I don't have so that I can depend on you. And I'll be given gifts that you don't have that you can depend on me. Why? Because God wants to teach us that we are inseparable body parts spiritually we are all members of the same spiritual body and we cannot function independently because god doesn't want us to be lone wolf mcquades you know <clears throat> lone rangers but to be connected to the body of believers and become interdependent where i need them they need me and ultimately we need the triune god who supplies all our needs that's 1 Corinthians chapter 12, verses 1 to 31, the entire chapter. That's the theme of the entire chapter, right? Secondly, the reason why God hasn't given any one individual all the gifts, so that no one human being becomes the focus and attention of the body of Christ. Because your undivided allegiance, your undivided attention, your unconditional love is to be rendered to God and God alone, Father, Son, Holy Spirit. What does that mean? It means that you must know your limitations and do not venture into areas that you have no expertise. This is why I can't debate a atheist. I have no doubt and I'm convinced God is real, right? But to then debate a very sophisticated atheist on a high intellectual level, that's not my field because I wasn't attacked by atheists. I was attacked by Muslims and anti-Trinitarians like Joe's witnesses. So I focused my energy by the grace of God in that area to refute them. So when I meet a sharp atheist and my arguments are not good enough for him, 
I will defer him to those soldiers, those warriors that God has raised up and given them wisdom to demolish and decimate atheism to show it's a lie from the pit of hell. Right? Same thing with Mormonism. I know enough about Mormonism to refute it, but I am not an expert, so I will defer to the experts. Similarly, don't take a debate with someone who's going to bombard you with Old Testament passages or rabbinic sources to try to refute the New Testament or the concept of the Trinity if you're not well-versed in those areas. And James White is pitiful. This is why, embarrassingly, in the closing statements, he had to appeal to Michael Brown. My good friend, Michael Brown, would decimate, shred these arguments. Then why didn't you have Michael Brown debate him? Why did you? You with me there? Why'd you do it? Sorry, I don't want to make it like Damon. I don't want to be him. May God have mercy on him and save him and convict him and restore him and preserve me. I don't want to turn this into a DL show where I'm bashing Christians. But why didn't you ask Michael Brown to debate then? Why'd you take the debate and embarrass us? You get my point? So how does this relate to Isaiah? That gentleman kept saying, the servant of Isaiah is not Messiah, it's Israel. Now let's look at Isaiah 49, verse 3. Isaiah 49, verse 3. Let's look at it again. Guys, do not get into side talks about other issues like atheism. Focus. I was just trying to make a point. Okay. Isaiah 49, verse 3. Read with me. And said unto me, Thou art my servant, O Israel, whom I will just be justified. See, I will be glorified. We got you, Christians. Isaiah 49, 3. It says, the servant is Israel. You're destroyed. Bam, you're out of here. You see? And he said unto me, Thou art my servant, O Israel, in whom I will be glorified. You're done, Christian. How dare you misquote these passages in Isaiah and say it's about Messiah. See, it says Israel. Israel, you perverters of God's word. Okay, are you are you there now? Are you following me? You following me, the objection? See, they got us there. They got us. It's Israel. We're done. Okay, but now pay attention. Are you ready to pay attention? No, it's not all about Messiah, Tony. It is about the nation and the Messiah. But now you want to see how this very chapter demolishes and decimates these wicked, lying, satanic rabbis like Tobias Singer, this agent of Satan, this child of the devil. You want to see how Isaiah 49 destroys them and shows they are the perverts, the Bible perverts who pervert God's word to their shame and destruction? Are you ready? This is where I want you guys take a moment. Don't even text. Read. Don't even text. Read Isaiah 49, verses 3 to 6. Don't even text now. Read, guys. Catch what's going on here. Isaiah 49, verses 3 to 6. Watch. Read. And said unto me, Thou art my servant, O Israel, on whom I will be glorified. Okay? Then I said, the servant Israel said, I have labored in vain. I have spent my strength for naught. And in vain, yet surely my judgment is with Jehovah and my work with my God. And now say Jehovah that formed me from the womb to be a servant, pay attention, to bring Jacob again to him, though Israel be not gathered, ye shall be glorious in the eyes of Jehovah and my God. And he said, it is a light thing that thou shouldest be my servant to raise up the tribes of Jacob and to restore the preserved of Israel. I will also give thee for a light to the Gentiles that thou mayest be my salvation at the end of the earth. Wait, 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 wait. The servant Israel said, pay attention, verse 5. Now said Jehovah that formed me from the womb to be a servant, to bring Jacob again to him, though Israel be not gathered. But I thought you are Israel. Israel, what are you doing talking about gathering Jacob and Israel doesn't want to be gathered? What are you doing, Israel, speaking in verse 6, that Jehovah said it is too small a thing for you to simply raise up the tribes of Jacob and restore the preserve of Israel. I will also give thee for a light to the Gentiles that thou mayest be my salvation unto the end of the earth. I thought you're Israel. Why are you, Israel, talking about saving Israel? Did you guys catch it? How many Israels there are? Do 
Did you see how many Israels there are? There is this servant here, Israel. And then there's the nation of Israel that the servant will gather and save the nations. Two Israels, friend. Yes, it is true. Earlier in Isaiah, the nation of Israel is called God's servant. But he has harsh things to say about his servant Israel when it's referring to the nation. You are blind, you are deaf, and you are wicked, and you're evil. But then over here, Isaiah 49, this servant is glorious. God will be glorified in him. God delights in him and says, it's too small a thing for you, my servant Israel, to save Israel. You're more than that. You're going to be the light that brings my salvation to the whole creation. Yeah. Lopez is getting too excited, bringing up issues that he wants to tie in with the subject. I think Lopez, uh, we're going to have to put him on timeout. What do you guys think? He's excited now. Israel means prince of God. Okay, Lopez, how does that tie in with my point? Stuck for a lot of Balalim. Oh, the Balalim and Shaytan regime. Okay, you with me there? I love this brother, but not too much. Just like uh, Iriota, I love him, but not too much. Okay, you with me there? How many Israels, folks? Let's read it one more time. Yeah. Thank you for telling us, Lopez. Because if you didn't tell me this, I would not have known. Anyway. Uh, Isaiah 49, verses 3 to 6. One more time. Let's read it. One more time. Isaiah 49, verses 3 to 6. Yep. And said unto me, Thou art my servant, O Israel, in whom I will be glorified. He said to me, I am Israel, and he'll be glorified in me. Then I, the servant Israel, said, I said, I have labored in vain. I have spent my strength for naught and in vain, yet surely my judgment is with Jehovah and my work with my God. Now notice, the servant is speaking in verse 5. And now say Jehovah that formed me from the womb to be his servant, to bring Jacob again to him. Though Israel be not gathered, yet shall I, Israel be not gathered, yet I, distinction, I, be glorious in the eyes of Jehovah, and my God shall be my strength. And he said, it is a light thing that thou, you, my servant Israel, shouldest be my servant to raise up the tribes of Jacob, to restore the preserved of Israel. I will also give thee, I will also make you a light to the Gentiles, that thou mayest be my salvation unto the end of the earth. How many Israels again? How many Israels again? So you see how Isaiah 49 just proved there's not one Israel, but two Israels. One is an individual whom God will be glorified in, who's glorious in the sight of God, whom God delights in. And the other is the nation that needs saving, needs gathering, needs to be united to God again. You catch it? You caught it? Okay. So how in the world could James White let this guy get away with butchering Isaiah this way? Because James White is not well-versed in the Hebrew Bible. I'm not boasting. May God crucify my flesh. I would have done a much better job than him when it came to those issues. So would Michael Brown. So would Anthony Rogers, my brother in the Lord. So would Anthony Rogers. Okay. Okay. But if there are two Israels, what did we just establish? What did we just establish? There's an individual named Israel and the nation called Israel in the book of Isaiah. That individual is the Messiah. Okay. Do you now see? Do you now see? Who bragged on me? Do you now see that one of the prophetic names of the Messiah is Israel? And another prophetic name of Messiah is David. Did you now see the clear proof from the Hebrew scriptures? The one to come, the Messiah. He's called Israel and David. Have I established that? And some of you already know this. I'm preaching to the choir. Have I established that? Okay. Now, I don't know if you caught it. I don't know if you caught it. 
In Isaiah 49, verses 1 to 6, it was that individual speaking, right? He was speaking, not the nation, right? He was speaking, right? Let's look at it. Isaiah 49, verses 1 to 3. Okay, Isaiah 49, verses 1 to 3. Listen, O Isle, unto me, and hearken, ye people, from far. Jehovah hath called me from the womb, from the bowels of my mother, hath he made mention of my name, and he hath made my mouth like a sharp sword. In the shadow of his hand hath he hid me, and made me a polished shaft. In his quiver hath he hid me, right? And then verse 3, and said unto me, Thou art my servant, O Israel, in whom I will be glorified. Folks, it's that individual servant called Israel speaking, right? Do you guys see it? But hold on. According to the New Testament, according to the New Testament, this servant is Jesus, and I'm going to prove it. That means 700 years before the birth of Jesus, Jesus is already speaking prophetically in Isaiah 49. Those are the words of Jesus speaking through Isaiah in Isaiah 49. That means Jesus is speaking before he became flesh from his blessed mother. You caught it? These are the words of the Lord Jesus Christ. He's speaking. 700 years before his blessed mother conceived him by the spirit as a virgin and gave birth to him as a baby. Because he's speaking. Truth apologetics, don't ask me how. You're insulting my intelligence. Who is speaking in Isaiah 49 if it isn't the individual? And if that individual is Jesus, what do you mean how? Don't insult me like this. Who's speaking? The servant Israel. If that's Jesus, that means 700 years before Jesus is born, he's already speaking these words to Isaiah, who recorded it in his scroll, Isaiah, 700 years before Jesus. What do you mean, how? You guys see it now or no? Is it clear? So here is proof of the pre-human existence of the Messiah, Mashiach. That's why even in rabbinic Jewish sources, rabbinic Jewish sources, they speak of the Messiah already existing by the throne of Hashem, Jehovah. It's all in my articles. Basic, please don't presume to speak for this brother. He, he can explain. He's talking about how can it be Jesus speaking. Is that clear now? Is that clear? You have an individual called Israel, distinct from the nation of Israel. That individual, according to the New Testament, is Jesus. And yet this individual is speaking in Isaiah 49. And he's speaking about what God is going to tell him. When he comes out of the womb, so he's already speaking before he comes out of the womb, showing that he existed before he was conceived, an affirmation of the pre-human existence of the Messiah. He's already telling us the conversation that he's going to have when he comes out of the womb, even before he entered the womb and came out of it. Do you see it? Now, can I show you that according to the New Testament, according to the New Testament, this is Jesus? Can I show you according to the New Testament, this is Jesus? Now, as far as the rabbi is concerned, they're going to deny it's Jesus, but they cannot deny it's an individual. What you want to do is show that it's an individual, a person, one person called Israel, distinct from the nation. That you can prove. They're not going to accept that it's Jesus, but that's fine. Okay. Now, let's go to Isaiah 49, verse 2. 
Isaiah 49, verse 2. Pay attention because I got to make my case. That's why I said it's going to be a multiple part series. Now, notice what it says about the servant. And he hath made my mouth like a sharp sword in the shadow of his hand. Hath he hit me and made me a polished shaft in his quiver? He, he Hath he hit me? So notice, he made my mouth like a sharp sword. Revelation 1.16. Let's do the connection. Let's make the connections. Revelation 1.16. Revelation 1.16. And he had in his right hand seven stars, and out of his mouth went a sharp two-edged sword. That's Jesus. Out of his mouth went a sharp two-edged sword, and his countenance was as the sun shineth in his strength. Revelation 2.12. Pay attention, folks. Revelation 2.12. And to the angel of the church in Pergamos write, These things saith he which hath the sharp sword with two edges. Revelation 2, 16. Revelation 2, 16. And you tell me this book is not supernatural, it's not divine, and miraculously consistent. Repent, Jesus speaking, our Lord speaking. Repent or else I will come unto thee quickly, will fight against them with the sword of my mouth. Hmm, first connection that he's that servant. Made my mouth like a sharpened sword. Jesus says, a sword will come out of my mouth to slay the wicked, the unrepentant. Right? Revelation 19, 15. Let's read Revelation 19, verse 13 and 15. Revelation 19, verse 13 and 15. So you see it's Jesus. Verse 13 and skip to, to 15 then. Okay? And he was clothed with a vesture dipped in blood, and his name is called the Word of God. So his name is the Word of God. Now notice verse 15. The Word of God. Okay, And out of his mouth goeth a sharp sword, that with it he should smite the nations, and sh he shall rule them with a rod of iron, and treadeth the winepress of the fierceness and the wrath of Almighty God. So the word of God has a sword, a two-edged sword, that comes out of his mouth that is sharp to slay the nations. By the way, what does this metaphor mean? It's not literally a sword that comes out of his mouth. You know what it means? His mouth, the words from his mouth, the breath, that he uses to form words that come out of his mouth will kill people dead. It is metaphor. It is a metaphor to say that Jesus will strike people dead, kill people dead just by the words that come out of his mouth. He doesn't need to physically touch you or take an actual physical weapon to kill you. All he needs to do is say it from his mouth. You're as good as dead. You understand what it's saying here? Revelation 19.21. So I want to explain the metaphor. I'm not just going to, you got, because again, obviously a sword doesn't come out of his mouth. Okay. So then what does it mean? It means his mouth is like a sword that can kill you dead or give you life. Revelation 19.21. And the remnant were slain with the sword of him that sat upon the horse, which sword proceeded out of his mouth, and all the fowls were filled with their flesh. Let me give you an example of Jesus' mouth being a sword that can kill you dead just by the words that come out of his blessed mouth, his holy mouth, his pure mouth. John 18, 4 to 6. John 18, verses 4 to 6. You guys enjoying the meat? Okay. Jesus, therefore, knowing all things that should come upon him, went forth and said unto them, Whom seek ye? They answered him, Jesus of Nazareth. Jesus saith unto them, I am he. And Judas also, which betrayed them, stood with them. Now notice the power of his words, the words of his mouth. As soon as he had said unto them, I am he, they went backward and fell to the ground. The power from him saying, I am he, drove them backwards and knocked them off their feet to the ground. Just by saying, I am he. This shows you that Jesus is the all-powerful Son of God. And this shows you no one could lay their dirty finger on him unless he, of his own free will, voluntarily forfeited his life. So he's showing them, look, just by my words, I can knock you to the ground. I can kill you dead. So don't think you have power to arrest me. I'm allowing you to arrest me. Are you seeing it? 
to confirm John 10, 17, 18. This confirms John 10, verses 17 to 18. John 10, verses 17 18. Therefore doth my father love me because I lay down my life that I might take it again. No man taketh it from me. No man can take it from me. But I lay it down of myself. I have power to lay it down and I have power to take it again. This commandment I have received of my father. In fact, to show you how amazing, how majestic, how almighty Jesus is, even on the cross, he determined when he would die. Did you know that? He determined this is when I'm going to die. Even on the cross, they didn't take his life away. He gave up his spirit. Let me prove that to you. John 19, 30 to 34. John 19, excellent, Andrew Martin. You see what a beautiful man this guy is? He's already a Christian love with Jesus. Andrew Martin says, this is also why we should not blame the Jews for killing Jesus. This guy's no atheist. He's a follower of Jesus. John 19, 30 to 34. Read. When Jesus, therefore, had received the vinegar, he said, it is finished. He bowed his head and gave up the ghost. He gave it up. That's why the soldiers were shocked. The Jews, therefore, because it was the preparation that the body should not remain upon the cross on the Sabbath, for that Sabbath day was a high day, besought Pilate that their legs might be broken and that they might be taken away. Then came the soldiers and break the legs of the first and of the other, which was crucified with him. But when they came to Jesus and saw that he was dead already, they break not his legs. But one of the soldiers with a spear pierced his side and forthwith came there out blood and water. See, they came and they said, man, he's already dead. Notice that even the cross, they did not take his life away. He had given up his spirit and caused himself to die even before they had anything to do with it. Did it sink in or no? Did it sink in? No man can lay their finger on me. I can kill you dead just by my mouth. But I'm allowing you to lay your filthy hands on me and nail me on the cross. And even on the cross, I will determine when my spirit leaves my body and I die. Not you. I. Because I am the God of all flesh, the life of all creation. And in my hands are death and Hades. Right? How will the Lord Jesus kill the Antichrist? 2 Thessalonians chapter 2, verse 8. It's okay. Cry, Tony. Cry because we can't love Jesus enough. We can't praise him enough. We can't love him enough. I pray you cry from your heart, all of us, because he's real, Tony. He's alive and he loves us. 2 Thessalonians 2, verse 8. 2 Thessalonians 2, verse 8. Then shall that wicked be revealed whom the Lord shall consume with the spirit of his mouth, meaning the breath that it takes to form words and shall destroy with the brightness of his coming. Okay. So did you see the first connection? What was the first connection? The first connection that this servant, this individual called Israel is Jesus, is that Jesus, like the servant, his mouth is a sharpened sword. Do you see the first connection? The second connection, Isaiah 49, 9 and 10. Isaiah 49, verses 9 and 10. Isaiah 49, verses 9 and 10. Read with me, folks. That thou mayest say to the prisoners, go forth to them that are in darkness, show yourselves, they shall feed in the ways, and their pastors shall be in all places, in all places, so their pastures will be in high places. Now read 10. They shall not hunger nor thirst, neither shall the heat nor sun smite them. For he that hath mercy on them shall lead them, even by the springs of water shall he guide them. Revelation 7, verse 17, but we're going to read 14 to 17. Revelation 7, verse 17, but we're going to read 14 to 17. Bukhilni, was that me? You said that I was made for this. Were you saying that about me? No, actually, I think he said something that was blessing, a blessing. Read with me, guys. 
And I said unto him, Sir, thou knowest. And he said to me, These who are standing before the throne of God in white robes, a great multitude from every tribe, nation that exists, that could not be counted, standing before God, says, These are they before the throne of God. Read, and serve him day and night in his temple. And he, and he that sitteth on the throne shall, shall dwell among them. They shall hunger no more. Sound familiar? It's what you just read in Isaiah 49. Neither thirst any more. Sound familiar? Neither shall the sun light on them, nor any heat. Now watch this. For the Lamb, which is in the midst of the throne, shall feed them and shall lead them unto living fountains of waters, and God shall wipe away all tears from their eyes. So the Lamb is doing what Isaiah 49, 10 says will be done. Do you see the second connection? Second connection. Second connection. Isaiah 49, verse 8. Isaiah 49, verse 8. Second, uh, the third connection. That was the second connection. Third connection. Isaiah 49, verse 8. Third connection. This saith the Lord, in an acceptable time, I have heard thee, talking to the servant. And a day of salvation, I have helped thee. I've been with you. I will preserve thee and give thee for a covenant of the people. I will make you, this individual servant of mine called Israel, a covenant of the people. A covenant of the people. Luke 22, 19 to 20. Luke 22, 19 to 20. Luke 22, 19 to 20. And he took bread and gave thanks and break it and gave unto them saying, this is my body, which is given for you. This do in remembrance of me. Let's not get into debate about revelation. See what you guys are doing? Likewise, also the cup after supper saying, this cup is the New Testament. The Greek word, diathiki, 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 diathiki. I'm trying to pronounce it like the Greeks do. Is covenant. This cup is the new covenant in my blood, which is shed for you. Do you see what God said? I will make you a covenant. And Jesus says, this cup is the new covenant. Diathiki. 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 This cup is the new covenant in my blood. Yep. I'm trying to see how the Greeks pronounce it first and last. I have a hard time speaking English, right? Okay, did you catch it? This cup is the new covenant. What well, wait, the servant, that individual named Israel, he'll be a covenant for the people. And she says, hey, I'm here to make a new covenant with you. So wait, Jesus, like the servant, your mouth is like a sharpened sword. Like the servant, you lead them to living waters and feed them so they don't hunger. Like the servant, you're a covenant to the people. Man, it sure sounds like you are that servant. Duh. You get it now? Andrew, it's the same word. The Greek word for covenant and testament is the same here. Diathiki. That's why in modern versions, it's translated covenant. So, Andrew... The Greek word for testament is the Greek word for covenant. In fact, Old Testament, New Testament, you know what that really means? Old covenant, new covenant. Okay. Now the final connection, and this one is going to be a doozy. The final connection. Isaiah 49, 5 and 6. So, Andrew, when you talk about the New Testament, you're talking about the new covenant. The scriptures which proclaim the new covenant that Jesus established. Old Testament means the old covenant that was established by God through Moses for his people. Okay, Now, Isaiah 49, 5 to 6. Here is the fourth connection, but you guys got to listen and pay attention or you're going to miss it. Isaiah 49, 5 and 6. And now saith Jehovah that formed me from the womb to be a servant, to bring Jacob again to him. Though Israel be not gathered, yet shall I be glorious in the eyes of Jehovah, and my God shall be my strength. Pay attention. Verse, you got, if you don't pay attention, you're not going to see it. And he said, it is a light thing that thou shouldest be my servant. That's too small a thing. You're more than a servant. You're more than that. To be my servant, to raise up the tribes of Jacob, you're much greater than that. 
and to restore the preserved of Israel. I will also give thee for a light to the Gentiles. Pay attention. Light to the Gentiles that thou mayest be my salvation unto the end of the earth. Pay attention. You will gather the, the preserved of Israel. You will restore them. You will save them. But you are a light for the Gentiles for salvation, which you will bring to the ends of the earth. Did you guys catch it? You guys caught it now? The servant will be a light for the Gentiles in that he will bring salvation to the ends of the earth and he will restore the preserved of Israel, right? Okay, write down Luke 2, 31, 32, but we got to read Luke 2, 25 to 35. It's 31, 32, but we're going to read Luke 2, 25 to 35, but please, guys, pay attention to 31, 32, or you're going to miss it. Luke 2, 25 to 35, but it's in 31, 32, but we got to read the entire context. Pay attention. Don't get into side issues. Focus. Focus. This is me, guys. Read. And behold, there was a man in Jerusalem whose name was Simeon, and the same man was, ju was just and devout, righteous and devout, waiting for the consolation of Israel, waiting for the restoration of Israel, waiting for the salvation of Israel, waiting for the hope of Israel. And the Holy Ghost was upon him. The Holy Spirit was upon him, filling him. Pay attention to that. And it was revealed unto him by the Holy Ghost. So the Holy Spirit revealed it to him. Right? What did the Holy Spirit reveal to him? That he should not see death. He will not die before he had seen the Lord's Christ. The Holy Spirit assured him, you will see the Christ before you die. Wow. I wish the Holy Spirit tells me that. Sam, you will not die until Jesus returns. Hallelujah. Right? But now pay attention now. Pay attention. Nice. Don't lose it. 27. And he came by the Spirit. So the Spirit brought him to the temple. The Spirit is telling him, Simeon, here's my promise to you. I will keep you alive until you see the Christ. And when Jesus was brought in, the Spirit says, he's here. Where? Follow me. And the Spirit brings him to Jesus. And when the parents brought in the child Jesus to do for him after the custom of the law, then took he up in his arms and blessed God and said, now, before we move on, I got him packed 28, 29. Okay. Don't, don't put anything in. Okay. Watch here. This is what happened. The Holy Spirit says, Simeon. Yes, Lord. He's here. Where? Come. I will lead you to him. There he is, Simeon. So I'm about to, I'm moved in the spirit now. <laughs> Being moved. What is his reaction? <clears throat> he picks him up. In his arms. And then notice his words. Notice his words. Lord, now lettest thou thy servant depart in peace according to thy word. And he goes, in other words, I can die now happy. Lord, take me home. Because now I know here is my salvation. You have kept your word. You are faithful to Israel. Let me die. I can die in peace. Here he is, your salvation. Wow. You see how amazing that is? <clears throat> the Spirit tells him, Simeon, I'm going to give you a blessing. What is it, Lord? You will see the Christ before you die. Really? I can't wait. When he comes to the temple, <clears throat> when he comes to the temple, the Spirit says to him, he's here. He's here. Let me take you to him. There he is. <clears throat> Takes him in his arms. And he sees the human face of God. The baby who is his God, his Savior. And he looks at the Father and says, Lord, I can die now. Because I have seen your salvation. I'm ready to go home. What I want you to take from this is that it's the Holy Spirit who brings you to Jesus. It's the Holy Spirit who reveals Jesus to your heart. It's the Holy Spirit who opens your heart and your mind to love and know Jesus. And he brings you to Jesus and he keeps you in love with him. Do you see it? You guys see it? Do you see the importance of the Holy Spirit again? Do you see how important the Holy Spirit is? How much we need the Holy Spirit? How much we need to be in love with the Holy Spirit. 
how much we need to be in union with the Holy Spirit and how much we have to cry out to the Holy Spirit. Holy Spirit, please possess me fully from head to toe. Own me completely. Make me yours. Cause me to be in love with you and never let me go. Do you see it? Who told him he would see the Christ, the Holy Spirit? Who then told him Christ has arrived, the Holy Spirit? Who brought him to Christ, the Holy Spirit? Who enabled him to believe that was the Christ, the Holy Spirit? Do you guys see it? Now we're going to read Luke 2, 29 to 35 again. I'm scrolling up to read it. Unless you want to post it again, brother. Post it again, Luke 2, 29 to 35. Lord, I love this. This, this is what moves me. Basically he's saying, I can now die in peace. I can go to my grave in peace because Jesus has come and you have shown yourself faithful. I don't have to worry anymore. My salvation has come. I can die now. You know what's beautiful when he dies? Because we believe that when you die, your spirit leaves your body, right? So his spirit left his body. He's still conscious, alive, without his physical body. As a spirit, with a spiritual shape by which you can still identify him. And as a spirit, he went into the netherworld. And guess what he would have told Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, and Moses? Guys, he's come. What do you mean? I saw him. Before I died, I held our Messiah in my hand. It's a matter of time, Father Abraham. And we're going to be out of this place. He's come. We're going to be out of here. He's going to take us to the Father. Can you imagine that? <clears throat> because he's he was going to die after that, right? So when he died, his spirit left, went into that nether room. Father Abraham, yes, my son. I held the Messiah in my hand. I saw him. He's come. Count the days. Lazarus, Moses, David, count the days. Count the days. We're going home. We're going home. We're going home. We're going home. Don't have mercy on us. He's come. He's come. We're going home. Lord has not forsaken us. <clears throat> Father Abraham, <clears throat> you who are the friend of God, your friend has come. Your friend has come. We're going home. Yeah. Okay. All right. <clears throat> Let's read now Luke 2, 30 to 35. But I fail him daily, the King of Kings. Luke 2, 30 to 35. Let's read. Let's read now. For my eyes have seen thy salvation. My eyes have seen thy salvation, which thou hast prepared before the face of all people. Guys, do you catch the language? A light to lighten the Gentiles and the glory of thy people Israel. Right? Did you catch it? A light To lighten the Gentiles and the glory of thy people Israel. Did you catch the language? And Joseph and his mother marveled at those things which were spoken of him. And then it says here. <clears throat> and Simeon blessed them and said unto Mary his mother. Behold this child is set for the fall and rising again of many in Israel. Many will fall because they don't believe in him. But many will be raised when they believe in him. For a sign which shall be spoken against. Yea, a sword shall pierce through thine own soul also. See, he knew he would have to die for our sins. And he's saying to Mary, Mary, I have to let you know, this child is going to end up piercing your heart because you're going to see your baby hanging on a cross, naked, beaten to a bloody pulp, whipped to the point of death, spikes in his hands and in his feet, gasping for air before your eyes. 
that the thoughts of many hearts may be revealed. Okay. Now, yep. Now, let's look at this here. I want you to see it. Luke 2, 31, 32 with Isaiah 49, 6. Luke 2, 31, 32 with Isaiah 49, verse 6. Read here. Read with me. Which thou hast prepared before the face of all people, a light to lighten the Gentiles and the glory of thy people Israel. Now watch Isaiah 49, verse 6. Only verse 6. Verse 6. Watch here. See if you make the connection. Let's see if you make the connection. Isaiah 49, verse 6. What happened, Protestant? You disappeared? And he said, it is a light thing that thou shouldest be my servant to raise up the tribes of Jacob, right? And to restore the preserved of Israel. I will also give thee for a light to the Gentiles that thou mayest be my salvation at the end of the earth. Did you see it? Did you catch language? My eyes have behold your salvation, a light to lighten the Gentiles, the glory of your people Israel. What was the language that Simeon was alluding to? What was he alluding to in describing Jesus? What was he alluding to? Isaiah 49. So Simeon, filled with the Holy Spirit, notice that's the child of Isaiah 49. Do you see how much meat is there in this book? Do you see how much meat is, there in, is in this book? Now, excuse me. What's the point of all this? Do you now see irrefutable proof from the Hebrew Bible that one of the names of the Messiah is Israel? One of the names of the Messiah is Israel. Is there any way of refuting this? Any way of refuting it? Isn't it clear as day that in Isaiah 49 there are two? called Israel. This individual called Israel and the nation called Israel. And this individual saves the nation and saves the world. Clear, right? Now do you understand why Matthew and the others would take passages about the nation of Israel and apply it to Jesus? Because they saw, oh, like the nation, Jesus did this. Like the nation, Jesus experienced this. Like the nation spent 40 years in the desert to be tempted Jesus spent 40 days in the desert to be tempted. Hmm, I'm seeing a pattern here. Do you get it now? So was Matthew butchering Hosea or Matthew saw what we now see by the Spirit that Jesus is true Israel? So there are things in his life that we find in the life of the nation. Like Israel, Jesus went into Egypt. Like Israel, Jesus went into the desert. And so on and so forth it goes. Are you seeing it now? Yes, yeah, send these dogs, this airy dog, this filthy dog of Satan and his filthy rabbis, these spiritual whores, to their father, the devil. Jesus was right about you. You are of your father, the devil. Sorry, folks. I'm not here to tickle ears. Ari Silverman. Proof that he's a son of the devil. Okay? But for the rest of you who are paying attention. Is it clear? Clear, right? Clear as day? We made the case. Jesus is Israel. He's true Israel. And therefore, he's going to now... Relive moments in Israel's experience, but with one difference. They fail, he succeeds. Now, let me prove that to you. Let's go to Numbers 13, 31 to 33. Numbers 13, 31 to 33. This is how I would decimate, barbecue that guy Lee and his father, Tovia Singer. Okay. Numbers 13, 31 to 33. Numbers 13, 31 to 33. Okay, let's read. And Caleb still the people before Moses, even though Protestant loves me, he gives me an extra verse. I still love you. And notice he skips 31. Protestant, what happened, bro? 
In kindergarten, they didn't teach you that 30 is before 31? What happened, bro? Dude, what happened? Protestant, man. That's what happens when you're Protestant. You're always trying to protest. Even the numbering system, you're protesting. No, zero and two. There's no one. Stop the protest, man. It's over. Numbers 13, 31, and 33. Let's read. Read with me. But the men that went up with him said, we be not able to go against the people, for they are stronger than we. And they brought up an evil report of the land, which they had searched unto the children of Israel, saying, the land through which we have gone to search it, right? Now notice this, search it. And there was there we saw the giants, the son of, sons of Anak, which come of the giants, and we were in our own sight as grasshoppers, so we were in their sight. Okay, because... Let's do it again. Numbers 13, 31, 33, because we went all over the place and I see things are missing. One more time. Numbers 13, 31, and 33. You know that check where it's all zeros? I'm not sending it to you. Numbers 13, 31, and 33. But the men that went up with him said, with Caleb, we be not able to go up against the people, for they are stronger than we. And they brought up an evil report of the land, which they had searched unto the children of Israel, saying, The land through which we have gone to search it is a land that eateth up the inhabitants thereof, and all the people that we saw in it are men of a great stature. And there were we saw the giants, the sons of Anak, which come of the giants, and we were in our own sight as grasshoppers, so we were in their sight. Now, you understand what's happening here? We got lost, but in Jesus' name we're back. Twelve spies were sent from the twelve tribes, to spy out the land of Canaan. They came back. Caleb and Joshua says, man, the land is beautiful. It's bounteous. Let's go take it. The 10 other spies said, no. Numbers 13, 31, 33. There are the sons of Anak, the ancestor of Goliath. They're giants. They're Nephilim. Nephilim. They're Nephilim. You know that word giants there in 33? It's the word Nephilim. Nephilim. The same word used in Genesis chapter 6, verse 4. Okay? They're giants. It makes everyone look like grasshoppers. There's no way we can defeat them. So the people got scared, and they started complaining and didn't want to go into the land. No, we're not going to go. Forget it. They're going to kill us. So because of the 10 spies, they struck fear into the hearts of the nation. Even though Joshua and Caleb said, don't be afraid. God will deliver them into our hands. They go, no, we're not going. We're not going. Yeah, Nephilim, Nephilim, uh, that translation, Andrew, Giants is the Hebrew word Nephilim. Nephilim, that's used in Genesis 6, verse 4. Okay. But what does God do now because he's angry with them? What does God do now because he's angry with them? Numbers 14, 33 and 34. Numbers 14, 33 and 34. And your children, God speaking now, he's upset. Pay attention. And your children shall wander in the wilderness 40 years. They're going to wander in the wilderness 40 years. Why 40 years? And bear your whoredoms unto your carcasses be wasted in the wilderness. Why? After the number of days in which ye search the land, even 40 days, each day for a year shall ye bear your iniquities, even 40 years, and ye shall know my breach of promise. You see what he said? You're going to spend 40 years in the wilderness, and this generation is going to die. So your children enter, not you, your punishment. Because each day it took them to scout the land, you'll remain in the wilderness for a year. It took them 40 days, 40 days to scout the land. You're going to stay 40 years. Guys, do you see what's going on here? 40 days equals 40 years. It took them 40 days, you're going to stay 40 years. 40 days equals 40 years, a day for a year. Israel remained 40 years in the desert, Jesus 40 days, a day for a year. Are you seeing what's happening here? His 40 days corresponds to their 40 years. The nation spent 40 years, true Israel spent 40 days. Are you catching it or no? Israel spent 40 years. True Israel spent 40 days. Why did they spend 40 years? For each of the days it took the spies to scout the land, 40 days became 40 years. You got to get it before I move on. 
Okay. Now let's go to Deuteronomy 8, verses 1 of 5. Deuteronomy 8, verses 1 of 5. Deuteronomy 8, verses 1 of 5. Pay attention to verse 3. Deuteronomy 8, verses 1 of 5. Pay attention to verse 3. All the commandments which I command thee this day shall ye observe to do, that ye may live and multiply and go and, and possess the land which Jehovah swear unto your fathers. Pay attention. Deuteronomy 8, verses 1 of 5. Pay attention to verse 3. And thou shalt remember all the way which Jehovah thy God led thee these 40 years in the wilderness to humble thee and to prove thee to know what was in thy heart, he led you in this wilderness for 40 years to expose what's in your heart, whether thou wouldest keep his commandments or no. Pay attention to three. And he humbled thee and suffered thee, allowed you to hunger and fed thee with manna, which thou knewest not. Neither did thy fathers know that he might make thee know that a man doth not live by bread only, but by every word that proceedeth out of the mouth of Jehovah doth man live. Hmm. But now read 4 and 5. No, don't stop. Thy raiment, your clothes, wax not old upon thee, neither did thy foot swell these 40 years. Thou shalt also consider in thy heart that as a man chasteneth his son, so Jehovah thy God chasteneth thee. I discipline and chastened you as a son by bringing you into the wilderness for 40 years to teach you not to depend on food, but on every word that comes out of my mouth. Hmm. Let's go now to Matthew 4, verses 1 of 4. Hmm. Matthew 4, verses 1 of 4. Matthew 4, verses 1 of 4. Now you tell me, is it a coincidence what Jesus quotes? Then was Jesus led up of the Spirit into the wilderness to be tempted of the devil. And when he had fasted 40 days and 40 nights, he was afterward a hunger. And when the tempter came to him, he said, If thou be the Son of God, command that these stones be made bread. Now notice what he quotes. But he answered and said, It is written, Man shall not live by bread alone, but by every word that proceedeth out of the mouth of God. Wait, wait, wait. Jesus, that's Deuteronomy 8, 3. Yeah. But that's the same passage in the same context where God says to the nation of Israel, I'm treating you as my son which is why I'm bringing you into the wilderness to test you and tempt you so that you can learn to depend on me, not on bread. Yeah. Why are you quoting it about yourself? Why are you applying that to yourself? You don't get it yet? I am true Israel. And where that Israel failed in the desert, I overcame. I did what they were supposed to, but they failed, but I will not. I will succeed. You get it or no? You guys getting it? So was Matthew wrong for taking a passage about the nation of Israel being brought out of Egypt because Israel is God's son and applying to Jesus because he was seeing the pattern? Israel, the son of God. Jesus, true Israel, the son of God. That son of God brought into the wilderness desert 40 years, because of the 40 days it took them to scout the land, to be tempted and tested, and they failed, and then brought up into the land of Canaan. This Israel also went into Egypt and was brought up, and then also was brought into the wilderness after coming out of Egypt. Did you catch it? He came out of Egypt and later went into the wilderness for 40 days, which corresponds to their 40 years, but he succeeded and they failed. He succeeded, they failed. And you're telling me Matthew didn't know what he was talking about. And James White, you let him get away with it. You, you lost a powerful opportunity to show the depth, the beauty, the power of the word of God and the glory of Jesus Christ. Yes, he did. It wasn't so much the devil didn't know, Pando. It was saying, since you're the son of God, then do this because God favors you. So go ahead. Come on, God's son. Go ahead. Show off. That was basically what it is. Okay? But uh, not yet. Okay. 
Now, this I'm going to have to go through a little quickly. Okay, a little quickly. Okay. I'm going to show you how everyone points to Jesus. Are you ready? I'm going to show you how everyone points to Jesus. Specifically, I'm going to start with the case of Joseph. Okay. I've said this before. I'm going to say it again. Now, I need you to pay attention. You're going to write these down. We're not going to look at it. If you go to Genesis chapter 37, verse 19, Genesis 37, verse 19, okay? Genesis 37, verse 19. Joseph's brothers call him the dreamer. There goes the dreamer. Why? Because all throughout Genesis, Joseph receives revelation in dreams, and he interprets dreams by the Spirit of God. Joseph's father is Jacob, right? Jacob, Joseph. Joseph goes into Egypt and then brings Jacob into Egypt to save Jacob from death, right? And Jacob is called Israel, correct? Correct? Old Testament Joseph, son of Jacob, who's called Israel, who receives revelations and dreams, brings Jacob, Israel, his father, into Egypt to save him from dying. Okay. Go to Matthew 1, 16. Matthew 1, 16. Matthew 1, 16. And Jacob begat Joseph, the husband of Mary, of whom was born Jesus, who is called Christ. Wait, wait, wait. Joseph, Jesus' legal father, he too has a father named Jacob? Hmm. Matthew 120. Matthew 120. But while he thought on these things, behold, the angel of the Lord appeared unto him in a dream. Wait, wait, wait. This Jacob, son of Joseph, also receives revelations in a dream? Catch it? Hold on. The Old Testament Joseph, his father Jacob, he was Israel. And that Joseph brought Israel into Egypt to save him. But wait, Jesus is called Israel, and Joseph brought him into Egypt to save his life too. What? Now let me show you how Joseph becomes a picture of Jesus. Joseph becomes a picture of Jesus. Are you ready? Joseph becomes a picture of Jesus. Joseph, rejected by his brothers... Sold for pieces of silver, <clears throat> handed over to the Gentiles to be persecuted, exalted to become the Savior of the world, whom everyone had to turn to to be saved, Lord of the land, second to Pharaoh. Jesus, rejected by his brothers, sold for pieces of silver, handed over to the Gentiles to be persecuted, Exalted to be the Savior of the world, the Lord of all creation, second only to the Father. Are you catching it or no? When did Joseph's brothers recognize him? Acts 7, 12. When did Joseph's brothers recognize him? Acts 7, verse 12. But when Jacob heard that there was corn in Egypt, he sent out our fathers first. And then 13, 12 and 13. Verse 13 as well. Acts 7, 12, 13. I think there's a part missing, but it's again, I'm trusting that he quoted all of it. And at the second time, Joseph was made known to his brethren. Wait, wait, wait. At their first coming to him, the first coming, they didn't recognize him. At the second coming, they recognized Joseph. And they even bowed to him in, in honor. Jesus wasn't recognized by his brothers at the first coming, but then at the second coming, all the nation, all of Israel will recognize him and bow down to him. <laughs> and then notice in verse 13 says, At the second time, Joseph was made known to the brethren, and Joseph's kindred was made known unto Pharaoh. At the second coming of Christ, all his brethren, the entire nation, will be will recognize Jesus, he'll be known to them, and he'll make them known to the Father.
You catching it? You catching it there or no? I'm going to give you two more examples. First, let's finish it with Israel. Do you see now why Matthew could take a passage about Israel applied to Jesus? Is it making sense now? Is it making sense now? What is said about the nation can apply to Jesus? Is it making sense? Okay. Now, if it's making sense, let's go to Hosea chapter 6, verses 1 to 2. Hosea chapter 6, verses 1 to 2. Let's see this. And I'm going to end it with two more examples because I got to go. Come and let us return unto Jehovah. Pay attention to speaking of the nation. Come, let us return unto Jehovah. For he hath torn, and he will heal us. He hath smitten, and he will bind us up. After two days, he will revive us. And the third day, he will raise us up, and we shall live in his sight. Wait, wait, wait. On the third day, you will be raised up to live in his sight. On the third day, after two days, you will be revived and raised up to live in a sight. But you will be raised on the third day from where? You, Israel, will be raised on the third day from where? Hosea 13, verse 14. Hosea 13, verse 14. Hosea 13, verse 14. I will ransom them from the power of the grave. I will redeem them from death. O death, I will be thy plagues. O grave, I will be thy destruction. Repentance shall be hid from mine eyes. So I will ransom Israel from the grave, from death on the third day. Jesus, true Israel, revived, ransomed, raised from death, from the grave on the third day. Wow. So when Jesus and Paul tells you the scripture said Messiah will be raised on the third day, they're applying the biblical hermeneutical principles of prophecy by analogy, by similarity. Okay. Now, Solomon, his name is Shlomo. You know Solomon had two names. One is Solomon. And his name, Shlomo, comes from Shalom, which means peace, rest. But he had another name. He had another name. You know Solomon had two names? Some of you should know because if you've been following me, I mentioned this in previous sessions years back. He had two names. Thank you, Pedro. Now, Pedro got it. Let me repeat what he just said, Pedro Jr. Jesus was not kidding when he said the prophets prophesied by him. Yes, because Jesus didn't simply mean, mean look for a statement about a future delivery. He's saying all of it is about me. Everything's about me. Persons, their lives, their experiences, their events is all meant to point to me. Now you're getting it? The priests, the temple, the sacrificial system, Moses, Abraham, I... All of it is designed to point to me. Yep. Solomon's name is Jedediah. Go to 2 Samuel 12, 24 to 25. 2 Samuel 12, 24 to 25. Let me blow you guys away. Oh, there's nothing yet. Nothing yet. I don't know. Maybe I'll have to do another. So we'll see. And David comforted Bathsheba, his wife, and went in unto her and lay with her, and she bare a son, and he called his name Solomon. And Jehovah loved him. Jehovah loved him. And he sent by the hand of Nathan the, the prophet, and he called his name Jedidiah because of Jehovah. Jedidiah means beloved of Jehovah, loved of Jehovah. Did you catch why what Solomon's called? The one Jehovah loves, beloved of Jehovah, loved of Jehovah. You guys see it? But why was he called Solomon? He's called Jedediah because Jedediah means beloved of Jehovah, loved of Jehovah. I love this one. So call him loved of Jehovah. But why is he called Solomon? First Chronicles 22, 7 to 10. First Chronicles 22, 7 to 10. Why is he called Solomon? First Chronicles 22, 7 to 10. Oh, there's more king of kings. There's more. This, guys, also is indication why you see I'm being so viciously attacked by the kingdom of darkness. Right? 
an honor, a grace I don't deserve. I deserve hell. But because God has just blessed me for his glory with this supernatural anointing, my attacks are vicious. Right? But now read First Chronicles 22, 7 to 10. May God save me from my flesh, from my sinfulness, and save me from the attacks of the enemy. But read with me, guys. Please read. First Chronicles 22, 7 to 10. And David said to Solomon, my son, as for me, it was in my mind to build a house. I'm sorry. David said to Solomon, my son. David saying, my son. Pay attention. As for me, it was in my, hand, my mind to build a house unto the name of Jehovah, my God. But the word of Jehovah came to me saying, the word of Jehovah came to me saying, okay. Thou hast shed blood abundantly and has made great wars. Thou shalt not build an house unto my name because thou hast shed much blood. Well, I can't find it. Where's the other part of it, man? Upon the earth in my sight. Now notice nine. Behold, a son shall be born to thee who shall be a man of rest. Notice a man of rest. And I give him rest from all his enemies round about for his name shall be Solomon. And I will give peace and quietness unto Israel in his days. See, the reason why he's called Shlomo, because Shlomo comes from the same root where we get Shalom, peace and rest. So he'll be a man of rest, and his days there'll be no wars, but peace and rest for my people. So call him Shlomo. His name will indicate that I'm going to bring peace and rest. So you notice his name means peace and rest, right? Peace. Shlomo from Shalom, peace. Call him peace, the peaceful one. Because in his days, I'm going to give peace to Israel. Now pay attention to 10. He shall build a house for my name, and he shall be my son, and I will be his father, and I will establish the throne of his kingdom over Israel forever. <clears throat> Notice Solomon, Shlomo. He's called Shlomo because God will give peace to his people in his days. Shlomo from Shalom, man of peace, right? Jedidiah, beloved of Jehovah, who sits on Jehovah's throne on earth, representing Jehovah, and builds Jehovah's temple, his house. Jesus, Prince of Peace, our peace. John 14, 27, my peace I leave with you. John 16, 33, in me you shall have peace. Ephesians 2, 14, Jesus, our peace. He's peace, our peace, who makes peace between God and us. Romans 5, verse 11, Prince of Peace, Isaiah 9, verse 6. He is beloved of the Father, Matthew 3, 17. This is my beloved son, my son whom I love, in whom I am well pleased. Matthew 17, 5. This is my son whom I love, my beloved son. Listen to him. Ephesians 1, 1, 6. The beloved. Colossians 1, 13. The son of his love. Do you see the other connection between Jesus and Solomon? Solomon and Jesus. Peace. Solomon and Jesus. Beloved of Jehovah. Solomon and Jesus sit on God's throne. And when does Solomon build the temple? When he sits on the throne. When does Jesus build God's spiritual temple, the house of believers? When he sits on the throne and pours out the Spirit, giving birth to the church, the temple of God. You catching it? But now watch this. 2 Samuel 7, 14. 2 Samuel 7, 14. Almost done. Almost done. I gave you a lot of meat. You got to go back and re-listen to this and then re-re-listen to this and pass it on. 2 Samuel 7, 14. I will be his father and he shall be my son. Speaking of Solomon, pay attention. I will be his father. He shall be my son. If he commit iniquity, I will chase him with the rod of men and with the stripes of the children of men. Now notice what he said. When your son Solomon sins, I will punish him using men, right? I will have men beat him with rods, and I will have the sons of men whip him, strike, right? Strikes meaning whip him, right? But folks, all you need to do, we're not going to code it here. I want you to take a moment to read 1 Kings 11 tonight. When Solomon did sin, he took 700 wives, 300 concubines, foreign women, and he worshipped their gods and goddesses, and God got angry with him. And he said to him, you know what? Because you did this, I'm not going to destroy the kingdom. I'm going to separate into and give a part of it in the hand of your enemy. But I'm not going to do it in your lifetime. Out of love for David, I will let you rule as king till you die. I will do it in the lifetime of your son. So God never punished Solomon. Guys, pay attention. God never punished Solomon. For the sake of David, he spared him. But God swore here. 
If he sins, I, I will chasten him with the rods of men. I'll raise men to beat him with rods and to whip him. Stripes meaning to whip him. Hold on. God did punish Solomon. Why do you think Jesus was beaten with the rods of men and whipped with the flogging of the sons of men? The punishment of Solomon fell on Jesus because Solomon was a type of Christ. He took the punishment of Solomon and the sons of David, a punishment that God spared them because he punished them in Jesus, the greater David, the greater Solomon. I'm going to whip Solomon with, this, with the children of men and beat him with the rods of men. Solomon, for the sake of your father, I'll spare you. Jesus, Solomon is a picture of you. You will take the punishment he deserves because you are his substitute. And that's why 2 Samuel 7, 14 is applied to Jesus in Hebrews 1, verse 5. Hebrews 1, verse 5. Let's read it. Hebrews 1, verse 5. For unto which of the angels said he at any time, Thou art my son, this day have I begotten thee. And again, I will be to him a father, and he shall be to me a son. He quoted Psalm 2, 7 and 2 Samuel 7, 14 and applied it to Jesus Christ. You know why? Because it's all about Jesus. Solomon is about Jesus. David is about Jesus. Abraham Isaac is about Jesus. Israel is about Jesus. Joseph is about Jesus. Moses is about Jesus. Aaron, the priest, the temple, the sacrificial system. It's all about Jesus. Okay. Lord willing, I'm going to have to stop there and I'll mention some other points. Other things that point to Jesus later. Uh, Lord willing, I don't think I'll be on tomorrow. I'll be on Monday. Monday, God willing, because tomorrow I have a busy day. So Lord willing, Monday I'm here. But guys, pray for me. Wednesday, I get in my car. I drive two days to a new state. Ask God to grant me traveling mercies, to protect me there from the corrupt judge here, and to chase and rebuke this judge and save me from her to provide for my children, to keep them perfectly healthy and safe and love them and provide through me for them and bring them to me eventually because I'm going to be there without them, trusting by faith they'll come to me in Jesus' name to chasten their mother, to repent and fear God and pray God will provide my daily provisions and provide for ministry and make me holy for his glory, give me more wisdom for his glory, more faithfulness for his glory and help me to get healthy in Jesus' name. And if you guys want to Help me on my trip financially. You know how to do it. My Patreon, if not PayPal. Keep praying. God willing, as long as God, God wants me to do this and gives me breath, I will teach you. As long as he wants me to teach you and fills me with the wisdom to teach you and give me the power to love him more than anything. Pray for me. Please hit the like button. Subscribe. Pass on the YouTube page. Pass on the articles. Study them. Download them. Print them out. Don't edit them. And don't sell. Don't charge for them. Use them to glorify Jesus Christ. Right? And pray I can be more like Jesus and love you with the love of Jesus. Christ has died. Christ has risen. Christ will come again. Jesus Christ is Yahovah to the glory of God the Father. Amen. Come Lord Jesus. And Lord, please fight for me. Fight for us. Fight for my daughters. Save me from this corrupt judicial system, Lord. And keep us in love with you. And keep us holy for your glory. Love you more than anything more than our lives. And please fight for my children, my angels. They belong to you, your gift to me. Bring them to me, Lord. We love you, Lord Jesus. We love you, Son of God. And like Simeon, we say, Lord, my eyes have beheld your salvation because you are the salvation from the Father. We need you. We depend on you. We love you, Lord Jesus. Please, Lord, don't let us go. We need you. Thank you, Son of God. I pray you come sooner than later, and we're ready to meet you by the power of the Holy Spirit. Surround us with a wall of fire from the Holy Spirit and cover us by your precious blood, Lord Jesus. Same for my children. Thank you, Lord Jesus. In Jesus' name, amen. Lord willing, I'll see you Monday, because tomorrow I don't think I'm going to be on. I'm going to have a long, full day. God willing, Monday. Okay? Take care. Christ is risen, risen indeed.